Uh, Brad DeLong is a guy that I've been aware of, you know, like online for an extended period of time. And I have uh, various times he's had uh, blogs that I've read to get his perspective on on some of these things, because uh, it's interesting to know who is advising uh, the Democratic establishment at any given time. And so he was a guy who was, uh, I think, a deputy assistant secretary for the Treasury under the Clinton administration. He is um, a self-described neoliberal uh, Rubenite. He wrote a uh, piece. I don't know where he posted this, uh, but he calls himself a Rubin Democrat. Um, he, uh, speaking of Robert Rubin, who was the uh, Treasury secretary under Clinton, and uh, and then also had a lot of influence under Obama as well. He wrote a uh, an op ed the other day, basically saying we failed politically, and it is time for us to hand over the baton to the left of uh, the Democratic Party. And uh, let me just read some of um, this interview that he did uh, with uh, Zach uh, Beauchamp and and Vox. Bochamp, um, because it's interesting. But there's another point I want to make here, too, that uh, it starts with the baton rightly passes to our colleagues on the left. We're still here, but it's not our time to lead. The core reason, uh, DeLong argues, is, is political. He goes on to say, uh, when asked what I, uh, movement he identifies with, it's uh, I would say it's largely neoliberal, market-oriented, and market regulation in tuning aimed at social democratic ends. Rubin Democrats believe you should prioritize economic growth. The idea being that we can look to the market to provide the material needs of, um, at the very least, the those people who are um, who are in the worst positions economically in in the in the country right so that's how we provide a safety net and we raise all boats by uh you know a rising tide and he goes on to say we were 100 percent wrong on the politics particularly in the context of the obama administration he says barack obama rolls into office with mitt romney's health care policy with John McCain's climate policy, with Bill Clinton's tax policy, and George W. H. W. Bush's foreign policy. He's all these things, not because the technocrats in his administration think they're the best policies possible, but because White House advisor David Axelrod and company say they poll well. And he says all of these with the idea that you could then collect a broad political coalition behind what is indeed Romney's health care policy, McCain's climate policy, H.W. Uh, Bush's foreign policy. And did George H.W. Bush and Mitt Romney, did John McCain say a single good word about anything Barack Obama ever did over the course of eight solid years? No, they fucking did not, he says. <laughs> No allegiance to the truth on anything other than the belief that John Boehner, Paul Ryan, and Mitch McConnell are the leaders of the Republican Party. And since they've decided on scorched earth, where we back them to the hilt. This is a guy who learned the lesson. Uh, sadly, not in real time, but better late than never. He will he not says, see the inside of a gulag. Today, there's literally nobody on the right between those frenetic... Uh, frantically accommodating Donald Trump on the one hand and us on the other, except for our brave friends in exile in the Cato Institute now trying to build something. Uh, and then he goes, um, he actually has a good line about that though. Later on. I don't know if it's in that same point. Yes. Well, it's, it's similar. He goes on to say like, um, uh, he says, when you say, uh, he's asked when you pa say pass the baton to the left, does that mean give up on substantive policies? Meaning uh, when you, meaning Rubin Democrats, disagree with the left, and he goes, no, it means argue with them to the extent that their policies are going to be wrong and destructive, but also accept there is no political path to a coalition built from the Rubin Center out. Instead, we accommodate ourselves to those to our left. Bend the knee. 
on some level, he's that's what he's saying. To the extent that they will not respond to our concerns, what they're proposing is a hell of a lot better than the poke in the eye with the sharp stick. That's either Trumpist proposals or the current status. In other words, he's saying you can have an argument with the left to try and fix their policy proposals, but at the end of the day, know that the worst case scenario in terms of capitulating to the left is far better than anything that is to the right of us. And he goes on to say that we need to reorient uh, who our coalition is and we need to accept policies that we think are suboptimal because they are far more... Um, they are far more acceptable than anything we would get from the right. And he goes, uh, until something non rubbleish is built in the Republican center, what might be good incremental policies just cannot be successfully implemented in an America as we know it today. We need Medicare for all funded by a carbon tax with a whole bunch of UBI rebates for the poor and public investment in green technologies. That's the best policy given the political economic context. If the political economic context were distant, were different, well, I'm fundamentally a neoliberal shill. But he goes on to say, our current bunch of leftists, as far as uh, our wonderful people, as far as leftists in the past are concerned, they're social democrats, they're very strong believers in democracy, they're very strong believers in fair distribution of wealth. He's, he goes on, he can't help himself to be, a, they could use a little more education with what likely to work and what's not. But they're people who we're very, very lucky to have on our side. That's especially opposed to the people on the other side who are very, very strange indeed. You listen to never Trump conservatives like Tom Nichols or Bruce Bartlett or Bill Kristol or David Frum talk about all the people they had been in meetings with biting their tongues over the past 25 years and your reaction can only be, why didn't you run away screaming into the night long ago? That was right. Because that was where he slightly redeemed himself actors. from the Cato. That is too. exactly what he's he's saying. You know, I'll take as much uh, neoliberal scolding as he wants to dish out as long as he's willing to bend the knee. That's exactly right. And uh, so this is, and and be clear here, what he's saying is that our politics failed and we have no better options than, than, I don't think he would say bend the knee, but he was saying we have no better options than capitulating to the left, even, again, if their policies are suboptimal. Yeah, and we'll I, would, about that. I would just add that Mike Konzel from the Roosevelt in, uh, Institute jumped in on this and said the failures of neoliberalism are bigger than its politics. Right. In other words, it's not just that there was a misunderstanding and misapprehension and miscomprehension uh, uh, of what uh, of of what partners they would find if they took steps to the right of the uh, the Rubin Democrat the neoliberal perspective. It's not just that they failed to find partners there because at the end of the day, John McCain was a um, uh, w was in it to win it and didn't care about any policy. Mitt Romney, also not a good faith actor. Neither George Herbert Walker Bush or any of them. It's also because their, their policies failed. And Konzo lays it out like this. He says there are two basic premises of the neoliberal policies. One is that these policies would create more growth so that, yes, inequality might increase, but so would wages. So economic growth first, redistribution, and beefing up the safety sec uh, net second. And he says the other um, premise of neoliberal policies was if we get government out of corporations' way, the market would become more dynamic and competitive and innovative. And he goes on to say that the first premise that neoliberal policies would create more growth and this in turn all, you know, all boats would rise uh, was a total failure. <laughs> the positive effects, he says, uh, Consul says, of more inequality never happened. 
Starting in 1980, the growth rate of the economy slowed. While the economy grew at 3.9% from 1950 to 1980, since 1980, it's only grown at a rate of 26 And more problematic is the rate of increase of relative mobility, the rate at which people would rise up and down the economic ladder flattened compared to that same period, the, uh, the Great Compression, as they call it. And he said, worse, absolute income mobility, whether you're better off than your parents, has also fallen. So the idea that neoliberalism would create more growth and that this growth would provide more opportunities, even if there was more inequality, every aspect of that fell apart. It didn't create more growth. And it certainly created less, far less opportunity. And that was the core. I mean, when people like Peter Mandelson and New Labor said that we're intensely relaxed about the rich getting super rich, this is the what it was always followed by as long as everything's going up, exactly. as long as we're cutting poverty, as long as we're improving living standards, then the oligarchs can go to the top. The second was that if you take the shackles off of business, they would innovate and grow out of uh, social problems. So there was relaxation of antitrust enforcement because it would lead to more competition, right? We've talked about this. Talked about um, the uh, Bork school of uh, antitrust taking over in the 80s. Unions would no longer get in the way of business. An unleashed financial sector would fund and lead the entire enterprise, right? All the innovation. Right. The idea of market power concentration was seen as laughable concepts stacked against the disciplining power of the markets themselves. Well, the story of the financial sector is quite obvious, but he also goes on to say there are two broader things that happen alongside it. First, at the, at the level of individual firms, is that firm dyna dyna dynamism has fallen dramatically. The rate of business startups has fallen. In turn, this has shifted the age curve of businesses further out, with firms over 11 years accounting for 70% of the workers in 2000, but 75% of the workers in 2014. This is where jobs are created when new firms are created. And I also just want to remind people that this kind of policy has not in practice been a truly free market policy. Like, they have made many laws and measures to sort of tinker with the market and prop it up, which is not generally what you associate with neoliberal neoliberalism, but is a very important part. Yes. And but I think like, you know, the regulations that are in there are, are targeted. He's talking about the broad perspective of neoliberalism, which is basically get out of the way of 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 uh, antitrust being the biggest single roadblock to the uh, to competition and dynamism in the markets, and none of that worked out. You had a decrease in the number of firms that are created, a decrease in the number of jobs that are created. You had less uh, labor market uh, mobility. The, the politics of neoliberalism have failed, but so too have the policies failed. And it's probably the case on some level that they're related, although that's probably another uh, post at one point. But it's interesting to see when you have folks like uh, Brad DeLong stepping up and basically saying, let's give up the ghost. There is real value to this. There is real value to this because it makes it that much harder, never mind for Howard Schultz, but it makes it that much harder for those on the uh, right of the Democratic Party. Like, you know, what is Joe Biden going to say now? Uh, there, was a, there was a story by Zach Carter about uh, Joe Biden's um, being one of the, the Democratic architects of this new era of antitrust that has been so disastrous. Uh, fighting Ted Kennedy on this 30 years ago. Um, but even for folks like Booker and Harris and Klobuchar and others, I mean, uh, there's probably about Jill five Brand. Jill Hick Brand. Hickenlooper. Hick well, Hick certainly Looper. Hickenlooper. But for these po folks to lose the cover of 
intellectuals in that movement. <laughs> At the very least, in terms of the politics, is well, and, uh, really problematic for them. Well, and also even at a very, you know, at a more base level, just the the resentful, destructive Clinton apparatchik still putting out the like, oh, the Clintons are just really concerned that Bernie can't beat, you know, Trump, which is like, okay, guys, I don't know if that's the people we want to be listening to advice on how to beat Trump, but more broadly, like, this is the old intellectual edifice of it, right? Like, this is this is the stuff that's supposed to sustain all of the pettiness. They, now, these are the actual arguments that are evaporating. To be yeah. fair, fair from his perspective, or I should say to be fair, but um, to to be clear eyed about this. Where I worried about where I him and I was worried about a Bernie candidacy, I would be telling Booker and Harris, you got to position yourself to as far left as you can get right now. Oh, definitely. Um, of course. You know, because he's not out there saying Bernie's the true. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I, he's definitely not saying that. I'm not I'm not putting that onto him at all. I just think that, you know, particularly. Well, I mean, you're right. It's actually but this in some is, ways. But this is the this, dynamic we want. This right? is exactly the dynamic. We They're want. out and there it, with pitchforks. Right. So you guys better be doing something inside here to keep the keep them and at it, bay.